First, I just want to say how grateful I am for Dale and Paul and Vicar and Mike and Jim. Uh, just due to the need uh, and the morality of others, uh, just leading the church. Uh, just as Dale was making an announcement about the building and um, saying that he was protecting me from sin. <laughs> uh, you can laugh at that. Um, I just, I, I just, I want to communicate just how grateful I am uh, to be amongst the brotherhood that leads this church. Um, it's just a, an incredible uh, delight to be uh, co-laboring with such godly, spirit-filled men. And I also just wanted to thank um, Jacques and uh, Marshall and Mike Donnelly uh, and Paul for just preaching um, so well while I was gone. I just thank God for them. So. Just, um, just wanted to thank them. Um, just feel, yeah, just feel so well paid for it. Um, and Peggy, thank you for teaching. <laughs> that was, uh, the maze was profound. So I feel like, um, let's just go back to worship. <laughs> uh, this is a, a really interesting text. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a little bit of time um, through this text because uh, there's a lot of confusion about this text, honestly. Um, and this text, I think, has a lot to speak to us, uh, especially about two topics. One is about um, deconstruction of faith. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are dealing with the deconstruction of their faith, and if, if uh, you presently aren't dealing with challenges of faith and, and the topic of deconstruction of faith, uh, I'm sure you are dealing with people that are, uh, and I think this text has to deal with that. Uh, it also has to deal with the, the topic of discipline um, and how God disciplines us, uh, which Peggy was talking about. And so uh, originally this was going to be a one-part message, but then I have about 4,000 words, and typically I bring about 1,800 words. And so I, I thought, well, let's, let's just spend a, a little more time here um, on this topic because I think it's a very, very important topic. Um, so, Father... I pray that you would help us. Um, man, I'm so glad that our faith does not depend on our hold on you, that it has everything on your hold on us, and that you God, are so powerful in dealing with people with weak faith, and that you ask us again and again to just cry out to you, um, Lord, to help us with our weak faith and to cry out to you, Lord, help us in our unbelief. Um, and so, Lord, again, I pray that you would do what only you can do, and that is to give us a sight of Christ in this text, to come and transform us again and again, and to build us, to build our faith, to strengthen our faith, Lord. Uh, and, Lord, we come in faith, Lord, that you will do that because you have done it again and again and again and again and again. And so, Lord, uh, do it again. Um, come and transform us. Come and give us eyes of faith that we would see the smiling Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that we would bend our knee in, in glad submission, uh, knowing uh, that you are the way and the truth and the life. Um, and that only you have the words of life. Only you do. There is nothing outside these walls that has the words of life. Only you have the words of life, Lord. Only you are worth submitting to. And delighting in, and loving, and being in. So, Lord, warm our hearts, warm our affections. Give us hearts of delight to submit to you, to fully submit to you in every way. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a preacher, I use my words, I use body language, I use volume, I use tone, I use facial expressions, all in the hopes to persuade you that the divine revelation in the Bible is true. That it is true truth. That it is real reality. That all of what it says is certain. And that it is certain about a person named Jesus Christ. Now, the text begins with one word, and if you will allow me one moment with a bit of rhetoric to demonstrate its intensity without being frightened, I want to do that. Consider! 
Consider. Pay attention. The preacher wants you to pay attention. Reason with careful deliberation, the preacher says. You see, the text right before Mike Bellamy spoke to you about verses 1 and 2, the preacher wants you to consider, the text uses an image of an athlete, a runner, running unhindered, running as fast as Usain Bolt in the 4 by 100 at 27.3 miles an hour. He wants you to consider it now. And the preacher changes from a runner to a boxer and to a father, and he wants you to consider how your heart responds to persecution and the testing of your faith. He has just held up to you Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith, and now he wants you to consider the testing and the persecution of your faith. Verse 11 in this text says that the testing of your faith is very painful and it brings deep sorrow to your soul that can lead you to despair and even leaving Jesus. And so in verse 3 he says, consider with deep deliberation. You see, since the beginning of this series, we have entitled this series A Better Word because the preacher wants you to know that Jesus is a better word. Chapter after chapter after chapter, the preacher is teaching to a small house church in Jerusalem who has endured the highs and lows of church life, and right now they are in a low because of significant persecution that have led some to deconstruct their faith and leave Jesus. It's fascinating to me that people talk now about deconstructing their faith as though it is a new thing. And it seems to be in right now to become an ex-evangelical. For most of history, it has been called apostasy. And it's the abandonment or renunciation of religious belief, and now it is called deconstruction which did not begin with Derrida's book, Grammatology, in 1967, or Foucault's book in 1961. It didn't even begin with Nietzsche's orifice. Deconstruction is not a response to Plato's forms. It is a response to God in the garden when Satan said to Adam and Eve, did God really say? Whether you call it apostasy or whether you call it deconstructing your faith, there is nothing new under the sun. People have been fighting for their faith since Satan has been speaking. And brothers and sisters in Jerusalem were dealing with it just as much as brothers and sisters have been dealing with it today. Just this month, I have had five conversations with people that I love dearly, that are going through it, that are fighting for their faith. And I get it. I have fought for my faith for decades. Do you know why Francis Schaeffer is a hero of faith? Because in 1956, he fought for his faith. And it's in the beginning of true spirituality, the fight for his faith. Generation after generation after generation have fought for their faith. There is nothing new under the sun. Persecution is a challenge, and these people were going through it. And the preacher actually says that the training, the discipline from the hand of your loving father, now this might sound odd, but the training and the discipline from the loving hand of your father is meant not to lead you away from the faith, but to build your faith. <laughs> And it is why the Lord needs to come in and give us perspective on what is real and true. Because left to ourselves, we are tempted to believe what is half true and what is untrue. And we listen to the whispers of the world and the enemy that twist what is true into half truths that are never true. And I don't want you to listen to half truths of this world that are never true. Do you understand that the best lies in this world are always have truths? 
So the preacher gives us two commands for us to apply. Pay attention and never give up. Pay attention and never give up. Pay attention and never give up. You see the command in verse one? To consider. That means pay attention. The second command is in verse seven. It is for discipline that you have to endure. In the Greek, it is endure. Do not give up. So right now we're going to pay attention and then next week we're going to learn how to never give up and it is good to be back with you. <laughs> pay attention to three things. Pay attention to three things. Pay attention to your leader. Pay attention to your leader. There are two types of students in this world, those that pay attention in class and those that don't. I remember one of my teachers telling my mother in seventh grade, Eric is a natural born leader. I just don't like where he is leading other students. I was definitely not one of those students who pay attention, so I spent my first year in college taking classes that most students take in ninth grade. The preacher says, I want you to carefully deliberate this next verse. I want you to pay attention to this next verse. I want you to carefully pay attention to this next verse, not to get an A on a test, but because I want you to follow the leader and that leader's name is Jesus. Jesus is the better word. Let me remind you, he is the great high priest. He is the better Aaron, he is the better Moses, he is the better temple, he is the better law, he is the fullest revelation of God, he is the son of God, and he is the king of kings. Let me remind you what Mike told you, he is the founder and perfecter of your faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he is seated at the right hand of God. Let me remind you who this man is, Jesus. Now, the preacher says, it is your turn, Christian, to follow that leader. In your reading plan, you just kind of smooth over real quick. He's, he's asking you to consider and deliberate, meditate on, think about. Consider him, Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility. So let's consider for a second. Who did Jesus? Well, who were the sinners, the category of people that Jesus did endure hostility from? Think about it for a second. I think there are three categories. Roman leaders. He endured a lot of hostility from Roman leaders. He endured a lot of hostility from religious leaders and teachers of the law who should have known better, right? I mean, they read the whole Old Testament and Jesus kept coming to them. Don't you know? Don't you know? I mean, you read the whole Bible. Don't you know? Roman leaders, corrupt government leaders, unjust government leaders, religious leaders that should know better, and then the third category probably brought him the most pain. Friends who turned into enemies. Judas. It took a second that didn't hurt him. And why were they hostile? This is speculation, but why? I think it's good speculation. Why, why were these sinners so hostile to Jesus? Because for the Roman leaders, he claimed power that only Caesar claimed power. And let me tell you, you will receive persecution when you take people's power away. Let me repeat that. You will receive persecution when you take people's power away especially corrupt government. He claimed to be king. And he claimed to be the son of God. Only Caesar claimed that. Religious leaders. John eleven forty eight makes it very clear why the religious leaders 
did not like Jesus and were hostile to Jesus. This is what they said. Everyone will believe in him. And listen to this. And the Romans will take away our place and our nation. Our place, our pride, our power, our money. They will take away our nation. Ah, nationalism, government, politics of the left, and politics of the right. <laughs> I love what J.D. Greer just said. Whenever the church gets in bed with politics, the church gets pregnant, and the offspring does not look like God the Father. Judas, if you read through the book of John, especially towards the end, you start seeing that Judas starts stealing money. Judas had a money problem. Judas had a status problem. Jesus wasn't meeting his expectations. Judas sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. So what is the outcome of paying attention to your leader? What is the outcome of us considering Jesus as our leader? It says right here, you will not grow weary or faint-hearted. You will not get fatigued. You will not give up. Well, why? Because I, I, I think once you start seeing Jesus, it starts actually setting our expectations of, of how this world works. Because in the immortal words of Pete Townsend, we won't get fooled again. <laughs> because it actually starts setting our expectations of what is true about our world. Does, it, does that make sense? Because if they treat Jesus this way, why would they not treat Jesus' disciples this way? Does, does that make sense? But, but, but here, here's the thing also. Jesus is a deconstructionist himself. Because every time the teachers taught the law, he says this, well, you say this, but let me tell you what I said. Jesus truly is the way, the truth, and the life. And so instead of following Satan, the deconstructionist, if you are in the midst of deconstructing, I want to say to you, follow the true deconstructionist, Jesus Christ. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And part of true and right and good deconstruction is stop following the ways of man and what man says is true. Whether that is religious leaders or political leaders or world leaders and follow Jesus in what he says is true. When Jesus says, well, man says that, but I say this. Here's what I'm gonna say, follow Jesus Christ. Follow Jesus Christ, amen? Follow your leader. Whew, my breath, man. Yeah. And I'm gonna walk on that treadmill, all right? You know, say amen. <laughs> I think Jesus sometimes confronts, especially the preacher in this text, he confronts our expectations. See, most of the time our expectations are unconscious, unspoken, unrealistic, and unagreed upon, especially with the Lord. What are your expectations with God on how your walk is going to be with Him and going to be with this world? See, if your expectations are it's going to be easy, no suffering, no dissonance. <laughs> like, you don't struggle with your faith. Like, the Bible shouldn't have any rough spots. 
Like the Bible's not going to tell you what to do. Like the teachings of the Bible are going to be easy for the world to accept. That they may not make you look culturally dumb. That nobody is going to suck in your life. Like there isn't going to be pain. Like nobody is going to be mean or hurt you. Like leaders aren't going to let you down. Like there isn't going to be betrayal. Like there isn't going to be political syncretism on the left or the right. And that there isn't going to be political religion or compromise. And that there isn't going to be absolutely no persecution. Let me tell you, for pastors, the past five years has been absolutely exhausting. And there's a reason that 40% of pastors have left their churches in the past 40 years. It's because of wrong expectations. Both for pastors and for church members. What did we expect? Which gets to the second thing. Consider the struggle. I think it is why people in the first century and in the 21st century are, are deconstructing. We didn't realize it was going to be such a struggle. <laughs> but this right here says it's going to be a struggle. It, 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 it has the analogy of a, of a boxing match in your struggle, that word struggle. It's only here in the New Testament, and, and it's always used in the Greek related to boxing. In your struggle, in your boxing match, you have to see that faith is a struggle. And I want to say that, man. Some of you have grown up in churches where it was not allowed to, to talk about how faith is a struggle, and I'm really sorry for that. I'm really sorry that your pastors were afraid to admit that faith is a struggle because they were afraid. But, but let me tell you and release you from the shame of it. It can be a real struggle. It's in this text right here. In your struggle against sin. Now that, that's an interesting topic because it, it actually can be in your struggle against sinners. It's, it's in your struggle against anything that is opposed to the teaching of Christ. Anything that is outside. Because what's interesting is everything that is talked about here in the discipline of the Lord He's not calling anybody to repent. He's calling you to endure. This is about the, the external work, not the internal work. This is about being opposed from the outside. Now, there are many other texts related to being disciplined for your sin, but this is not one of them. This is about being opposed by sinners. Because Jesus was opposed by sinners. And now he's talking to you about being opposed by sinners and in your struggle of this opposition. That creates so much doubt and dissonance. And what is this going on? Can you relate to that? I will say this, the closer you live to a city, especially like this one, you will struggle for your faith more. If your leader Jesus endured hostility, you will too. Think about it this way. He was the most loving human being this world has ever seen. And he endured great hostility. And let me remind you, you are not that loving. <laughs> You will endure hostility. Because think about it this way. You are called to make disciples. You are going out in the world and teaching people to obey everything Jesus said. What a call. And you are to do it 
representing and doing it with the love of Christ. Holy moly. What a call. Do you understand that? Not only are you to teach people to submit and bow the knee to Jesus, but you are also to do it like Jesus. Do you not see the struggle? The fight of faith in that? And if you do not see the struggle in that brother or sister, then it's probably because you're not doing it. It's probably because you're not teaching people to be like Jesus, or it's because you're not acting like Jesus. Does that make sense? Because you can go out there and you can command people to follow Jesus' teaching on sexuality or on power or whatever, and you can be a total jerk. And there's no struggle in that. Or you can be loving and all this and not be, teach people how to follow Jesus. There's no struggle in that either. Does that make sense? But man, when you do both and the hammer comes, and let me tell you something, the hammer comes from both the church and the world. And that's what's so disillusioning, especially when it comes from church folk. That's a whole other message. And this gets back to expectations in our struggle. Are you conscious of the struggle? Are you aware of your struggle? And are you letting the Lord know you struggle? This is the beauty of lament. Man, I read a lot of the Bible. I love the Bible. I read big chunks of Psalms. Man, David cries out to the Lord and laments, especially when friends betray him. You know you can lament to the Lord. Are they spoken? Do you communicate to the Lord that you don't like what's going on? Are they realistic? Are your expectations realistic? I don't want to get hurt, Lord. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> Are they agreed upon? Verse 4 says, in your struggle against sin or sinners, any source of hostile opposition to the church or Jesus, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It's clear from Hebrews 10 that the church had been persecuted. They had been reproached and afflicted. They had been put in prison. Their property had been confiscated. The letter was written in the late 60s, so they probably had heard, this is again speculation, they probably had heard of Peter and Paul's martyrdom. But he did not want them to give up. He, he wanted them to keep struggling, keep boxing, stay in the ring, keep fighting. Don't leave. Hebrews 4, he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will give you grace in your time of need. But he also wanted to remind them, Jesus endured to the end. He shed his blood. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He shed his blood. Who did he endure this for? To the glory of God and for you. You were his joy. He's, he's reminding you again. He shed his blood for you. He endured this great hostility of sinners for you. What is that meant to do? It's meant to encourage you in your fight against people who are persecuting you, who are challenging you. The people in power, the religious leaders who know better, the friends who have become enemies. Because why? This is disillusioning. Right? Yes? What was the illusion that we believed? Life was not meant to be this way. Jesus steps in and says, I agree. This is why I came, to set everything right. 
It is the church that proves that the church needs Jesus to die on the cross for the church. And it is the great illusion you believed that church members didn't need Jesus to die. Right? It is the church that proves that church leaders who have fallen need Jesus to die on the cross for their sins. It is the friends that have left you and completely disillusioned you and hurt you. It is them that proved that Jesus Christ needed to die on the cross for sinners. Do not leave the faith, run to the cross. Yes or no? But we sit there at the cross and say, no, I don't believe that because I've been hurt. And Jesus says, come to me. You who are weary and heavy laden, I will heal your hurts. Oh. Do you know why? Do you know why I know this? Because brother and sister, I have sat there before the cross and I have wept and wept and wept and wept. I've said it's not right, it is not right, it is not right, it is not right. And I have seen the door. I have seen the exit sign. And I've said, peace out. It's too much. I'm tired of boxing. I'm tired of struggling. I don't have any energy anymore. And here's the thing that I've learned in the struggle, and I'm so grateful for the Hebrew church, is the struggle is not alone. Find a community where you can struggle with other brothers and sisters, where there is no shame, where you can say to someone, I am struggling with my faith, and I'm ready to leave the exit sign, and I need the faith of other brothers and sisters. People that believe Jude 22. And people are merciful towards the doubting. Not shaming the doubt. Because it's a struggle. It's a struggle, especially when you're being persecuted. Lastly, pay attention to your identity. What the preacher wants to make clear as he transitions from the imagery of boxing is he wants to talk about family. He wants to make very clear that God is speaking to you not as a no-name undercard boxer that he has forgotten the name. He is addressing you as a child, a dearly loved child. Verse 5, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons and daughters? Love that. Have you forgotten? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I've forgotten because at the time that this was written, suffering and persecution was seen as a curse from God. It was, it was meant, it was, it was as though God was not happy with me. Have you ever felt that way? Like circumstantially, everything is going wrong. Lord, what did I do wrong? The preacher is saying the opposite. God is addressing you as children because you are going through persecution and trial. So the preacher brings up Proverbs 3 and he introduces the topic of training and discipline. And we'll, we'll talk about that next week. But he wants to tell you your true identity. Do not lose sight. Pay attention. If there is struggle and persecution and challenge in your life, the Lord wants you to know something. You are his dearly loved child. Your son, his son, daughter. 